We've had to change our road several times on account of that. We work in shifts around the clock. We can't say night and day, for it's daylight all the time down here in the summer. It's easy to lose count of the days completely. At Pram Point, the ground's frozen solid from 18 inches down. A few small explosions help in getting our foundations into the hard ground. To set the foundations, the formula's simple. No concrete's required. Melt some snow, pour the water into the ground, and it freezes solid again. The two planes, a beaver and an oster, were the last equipment to come off Endeavour. In providing the oster and the personnel to fly and service the planes, the RNZAF is making an important contribution to the expedition. Air reconnaissance changed our original plans. It was found that the Ferrer Glacier was not a good overland route to the Polar Plateau, but that the Skelton Glacier looked ideal. So a base is to be established at Skelton Inlet for the dog teams. Then they are to explore the route up the glacier on foot and find a site for the 270 mile depot on the Polar Plateau. The laying of the depot on the Polar Plateau is an operation with dog teams and planes. One dog team sets off from base to cross the barrier ice to the Skelton Inlet. This is the way both Scott and Shackleton went. Then two more dog teams are flown into the Skelton Inlet and from there they'll travel on foot up the Skelton Glacier. Several flights are made to the inlet and Mount Discovery becomes a familiar landmark. For dog teams, it's 200 miles across the ice to the inlet. The plane gets them there in about an hour and then brings in more supplies. Provisioning dog teams with aircraft certainly changes polar exploration. If Scott's party had had planes, their story would have been different. days after the two dog teams left the inlet, the plane contacts them on the Polar Plateau. A shuttle service then begins to lay the Plateau Depot. Flights take the plane up the glaciers and through the ring of mountains that form the coastline. These glaciers are huge, some wider than New Zealand's glaciers are long. From the air you realise that Antarctica is a cold forbidding land. We are now over the Ferrer Glacier then over the enormous snowfields that feed the glaciers. Finally, the polar plateau itself, stretching away for hundreds of miles without a break. They're 8,000 feet above sea level here, and with a 48 degree frost, it's more than cold. As soon as the stores have been flown in, the men and dogs will be flown out. Back at Scott Base, the radio masts are being pulled into position. The trial assembly of everything before we left New Zealand has simplified construction and is saving endless time. Everybody knows exactly where everything goes. The huts are prefabs, of course, but even they'd been given a trial put together before we left. To connect all the huts so it won't be necessary to go outside during the winter, there'll be covered ways of corrugated iron. It looks as if the winter party is going to be pretty snug. We begin to receive visitors. The first is Admiral Wright of the US Navy. He's very impressed with our quarters and our equipment. Like our good friend Rear Admiral Dufek, he thinks we're well set up and New Zealand has a lot to be proud of. Though there's a lot to tidy up outside, things are pretty ship-shape inside. Our radio is in contact with New Zealand, and today they're lining up for the transmission of the first radio picture. It's quite a history-making event.
some of us make a bit more history by calling up our people back home on the radio telephone. The folks just won't believe we're still in Antarctica. The stove's in commission too, so we've no complaints. There have been hardly any, but right from the word go, everybody's pulled his weight and then some. We've come to do two things during the summer, to build and establish Scott Base and to lay the first depot on the Polar Plateau. We're going well. Good planning, good organisation and plenty of cooperation have paid off. With the fine weather, more and more ice drifted out of McMurdo Sound until it's mostly open water. Some of us take the opportunity of going down on Endeavour to Cape Roy's to look at Shackleton's hut. It stood the gales of 45 years pretty well, but some windows have blown in and the winds have played havoc inside. We clean it up as best we can in the short time we're there. While we're at Cape Royds, we visit the Adelie Penguin Rookery. It's the southernmost one known and was studied by Shackleton's party. We take a census of the inhabitants. The chicks are almost full grown and are just losing their down. This one's trying to persuade mum to feed it. Some of the males are still trying to woo a mate with presents of stones, but the girl's not interested. Our advances to a full-grown chick don't get much encouragement either. While we're there, the sea freezes over and our dinghy has to be pulled to Endeavour by line. We also call at Cape Evans and climb the hill to the memorial to members of Shackleton's expedition of 1914. Below is Endeavour, Scott's Hut, McMurdo Sound and the shores of Ross Island. Scott's Hut is not in such good condition. Being the most accessible from the sea, the litter of previous expeditions lies around it. This is a 1914 model tractor. Now that things are fairly shipshape at the base, the scientists can spare time for research work. The biologists set out on a seal branding expedition. Though the distance is only about a mile, it's fairly tough going. Between the sea ice and the barrier ice, there's a strip that's been squeezed between the two into pressure ridges. It's full of crevasses and holes, so crossing it's not easy. The seals are lying on the barrier ice, and through holes in it, they come and go in search of fish. We take another census. The idea of branding is to find out whether the seals travel far. The expeditions of the other countries have been informed of our research and have been asked to report if they find any branded seals. Weather observations are important and this sunshine recorder is a unique kind as it's made to record 24 hours of continuous sunshine uh, when we get it. The summer days of 24 hours daylight are disappearing and we have our first sunset when the sun sinks for a few minutes. Close to Scott Base is the American airstrip for Operation Deep Freeze, and from it the Globemasters are on a shuttle service to the South Pole for supply dropping. They kindly take some of us along for the ride. As part of their International Geophysical Year investigations, the United States is maintaining a base right at the South Pole itself. The pilots are on target with the supplies, and we're trying to see the huts that will mark the South Pole. And there they are. Now the last letters home are being written by members of the Winter Party for it's time for Endeavour to return to New Zealand. Staying at Scott Base for the winter are 23 men. 17 of us belonging to the Summer Party are going home. It's quite a hilarious farewell. The Winter Party are leaving the ship to go back to Scott Base. In the spring, they'll lay more depots across the Polar Plateau. Then in summer, they'll set out to meet the British party from the other side of the continent. They move away from the ship.
a few men going into the long night of Antarctic winter. When daylight comes again, they'll be ready for the next step of their great Antarctic adventure.